Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guest today is a returnee. She is Mina B. She's a licensed social worker, mental health educator, and author of the book, Owning Your Struggles. With a background in psychotherapy focused on anxiety, depression, and trauma, Mina has worked across various mental health sectors, including early childhood programs, private practice, and community mental health. Holding a graduate degree from New York University, Mina is also the founder of Mina B Consulting, specializing in developing psychological safety within organizations. As a mental health educator and coach, Mina emphasizes the connection between mental health and social justice. Based in New York City, Mina is dedicated to empowering others and fostering supportive connections for personal and societal growth. We're excited to have Mina back with us today to take a deep dive into her debut book, Owning Your Struggles, A Path. It's not the name of the book. We're so excited to have Mina back with us today to take a deep dive into her debut book, Owning Your Struggles, A Path to Healing and Finding Community in a Broken World. Mina, welcome back to our show. Hi, Graham. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have you back with us. You know, Mina, I had such a great time with you in our last show, and I'm excited to have you share more of your book with us. And I guess I want to kind of get started around your book. What challenges were you seeing in people's lives and in society that were inspiring to you to write this book? So a few things on a micro and a macro level. On a micro level, I was seeing a huge shift in interpersonal relationships. I got the idea to write my book during the year of 2020. And so I'm sure we all remember that year dealing with the pandemic, dealing with social isolation, but also dealing with the grief that was happening on a macro level where we saw the murder of George Floyd. There were a lot of stabbings happening in the Asian American community. And a lot of us just felt not only disconnected, but we felt uncared for in many ways by our government, by institutions, by society. We saw a huge movement from the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd died. And so that year, I was really just sitting here thinking to myself, where do we go as a society from here? How do we heal? But not just as individuals, but collectively, because collectively we are wounded right now. The pandemic wasn't an isolated issue that happened. Maybe certain groups of individuals, it impacted everyone across the world. Now, there were more groups of people that were impacted at a greater level. We had essential workers who had to be exposed and go outside and work during a really difficult time. We saw huge shifts happen in the corporate space where work from home became a really popular thing in the work setting. And I think also in our interpersonal relationships, there were huge shifts happening where people felt like their communities were too dense. And so they had to move and they had to figure out how to build a new community that they wanted to exist in because they didn't feel safe on an environmental level where they lived. And so as I paid attention to just what was happening in the world and through social media, that gave me material for my book. But of course, my background as a therapist and just the things that I walked my clients through and had to sit with them in, you know, also played a role in some of the ideas that I already kind of had dwelling in my heart and dwelling in my mind. But then once 2020 came and the pandemic hit, I think that's when it kind of just became a massive thing that I realized, okay, how can I help people engage in the concept of community care and collective healing? Yeah. You know, I think one of the things that COVID did do was mandate us to be isolated, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, It told us to distance from each other, even the words we used, you know, social distancing rather than maybe, you know, creating kind of a safe space. We, we, we used, even used words that further created this isolation that you're talking about. But I think you're also suggesting that, and I would agree with you, that there was always, there, there was already some of this happening, you know, this isolation, some of these fractures. And out of that, you talk about how we experience a loneliness and a fracture, not just individually, but in our communities as well. What was your research showing you 
about, yeah, I think maybe COVID brought some things around because of the mandated isolation, et cetera. But there were some things maybe that this just highlighted. What were you understanding maybe being at a deeper level that was maybe explanatory of not just our individual loneliness, but the fractures within our communities? What was that about? Mm -hmm. So some of the things that I came across during my time writing this book that derives from the coronavirus pandemic was seeing how in whether it were interpersonal relationships or just in certain marginalized communities, there were different things taking place that pretty much played a role in people's mental health debilitating. So this was a year where one, when we think of the the community of work and work being our second space. So from the lens of sociology, our home is our first space, our, our work environment is our second space, and more of those social outings become our third space. And what I saw happening during the coronavirus pandemic was that our home became our first space, second space, and third space. Right. So, you know, All it was one. very overwhelming. <laughs> A lot of hats in that house. Yeah. Right. And so in many ways, I do feel like that fragmented communities because it goes back to that term, that social distancing, but not realizing that because we are biologically wired for connection, when our home now becomes our bubble, that we're forced to stay in, it impacts how we view the world, it impacts how we see people, it impacts our social and emotional development. Because we need to be around people in order to see our mental health increase, in order to build our relational skills, in order to practice intimacy. And we were stripped of, of a lot of those things. And so I think especially in the family system, there were some fragmented families happening where mm -hmm. There are families who felt like they had to move or there are some families that experienced fragmentation because the family unit was dysfunctional and people yeah. found respite by leaving to go to the office, yeah. by getting on the subway, by going to happy hour. And I, I find safety with my colleagues versus being at home. But again, now my home became my, my first and second and third space. And so I had to sit here in this conflict all day. And that was very difficult for a lot of people. I think that also put strain on certain relationships, but I also think it highlighted the ruptures that were already existing in certain relationships that we couldn't run away from. You bet. And so there was a lot of data to report that there were higher levels of divorce the year of 2020. And a lot of the research pointed back to women felt like they were carrying higher levels of a burden from not just caretaking because children were no longer in school, but also just managing the domestic load and not having any support while their partner was at home. Mm -hmm. And I think another thing that was happening is, again, we can sometimes mask issues by getting up and realizing, well, I got to go to work today, so I'm mm -hmm. going to be out of the house for eight to 10 hours. Yeah. But if that's not the reality anymore and we're staring at each other and we just had an argument over the weekend and it's Sunday, normally maybe we can say, well, at least I go to work Monday through Friday and there's going to we're going to have some social distancing in our relationship. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't an option anymore. And I think that that also created a role in some of the fragmented family systems that we saw come out of 2020, where we saw those higher levels of divorce because those ruptures never got the opportunity to heal. We also saw higher levels of people enrolling in couples therapy mm -hmm. the year of 2020, especially into 2021. And so I do think that was a time where, like I said, people realized, okay, there are issues that we actually can no longer run from through the lens of busyness and productivity. We're all home. And so we're finding a way to engage in work-life harmony or work-life balance, but we still have to do this together in our home. So that was something I, I noticed. And, you know, this is not necessarily related to the pandemic, what I'm about to share, but I do think because the pandemic was a form of trauma, it could have also triggered the other forms of trauma people experienced. And I came across some really interesting research done by UPenn, where it showed that untreated childhood trauma cost society over $10 billion a year due to the strain that it puts on social services. So the strain that it puts on the welfare system, the strain that it puts on police, 
the strain that it puts on childcare services or the strain that it puts on education where you have higher levels of expulsion, higher levels of suspension, higher levels of families needing more support. And so this all costs money. And even though this data was not pertaining to COVID, I do think that when we have unhealed trauma and we're exposed to newer forms of trauma, it can now, you know, reopen that yep. wound that wasn't really fully healed in the first place, mm -hmm. you know. And so some people had to be in home environments where their childhood trauma wasn't even healed. And now I'm kind of stuck in this environment that is not really fruitful for me or beneficial for my mental health. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Are you preparing for a licensure exam in psychology, social work, marriage and family therapy, counseling, or behavioral analysis? AATBS is here to help. We have been supporting behavioral and mental health students to prepare for their licensure exams for more than 45 years, working with over 1 million students to succeed on test day and move on to the next step in their career. With products ranging from comprehensive courses to quiz banks and delivered live online, self-study online, and in print, AATBS has test prep solutions that meet every student's needs and learning styles. Visit us today at aatbs.com. That's aatbs.com. And use promo code BHT15 to save 15% off your next purchase. I think that's such an insightful point. We, we do know around that that, yeah, you're right. There are these fractures there that maybe people could have avoided or... Mm -hmm dealt with in a way where it never really gets resolved, but maybe it gets dodged and it gets, you know, managed good enough. But then when you can't escape it and you're sitting with it, you were saying, you know, the divorce rates went up. We know that the substance use went up. We know that child abuse went up, all kinds of things. When you're trapped in that bubble with all three settings being in one setting now, yeah. it's going to come out sideways. And if it can't be resolved or brought to a conversation level and worked out, it's going to be acted out. And that is really true. As you're talking about kind of a rippling effect here and really becoming aware of what these underlying areas of vulnerability were, kind of pre-COVID, if you will, that maybe weren't addressed even back to childhood trauma. You talk about the snowball effect of trauma and its impact on the individual and society and the stress and the burden on the community when things don't get healed as well as a family, et cetera. Talk about this effect, would you? Yeah. So the snowball effect pretty much is the consequences of unhealed trauma, especially when trauma starts in childhood. And so data shows that when a child, especially when trauma impacts an individual during their primitive years of development, which is ages zero to five, it shows that it can impact them on a social and emotional level up to 20 to 30 years later. And so if a child is exposed to chronic trauma or even a com complex trauma, which is basically multiple forms of trauma that go on for a long period of time, it can now impact their own development and it can impact their social emotional development. So mm -hmm. studies show that when it happens to a child, especially during a young age, the first time we often notice these forms of trauma manifesting is in a school system where it leads to higher levels of suspension, higher levels of exposure rates because the child is probably acting out and engaging in very difficult behaviors that our school system really isn't designed to handle, um, especially when we think of mental health in the school system. I'm in New York City, and I know that generally there's always one social worker that's there to meet the needs of all children, mm -hmm. and that's not realistic. <laughs> And so because the education system isn't built on a foundation to cater to the mental health of children, now you have children who have higher levels of exposure, like I said, higher levels of suspension rates. And so that now impacts their own educational development. The higher they are ex dealing with expulsions or suspensions, they're least likely to attend college. Mm -hmm. And so now that they're not attending college, this also impacts job advancement 
This impacts economic stability. This impacts upward mobility. This also impacts their ability to sustain and engage in healthy interpersonal relationships and how they just blend into society overall because they've never gotten the treatment that they needed. So the more they were dealing with expulsion, the more they were dealing with isolation, the more they were dealing with ostracism because no one knew what to do with them That's right. because their trauma was so deeply rooted that it manifested in very difficult behaviors to try to mitigate and fix, and they never got the treatment that they needed, that can also lead to higher a higher likelihood of them engaging in crime and leaning more toward community violence where they're finding safety in gangs or finding safety in communities that are not necessarily healthy for their own well-being. Yeah. And so that is what the snowball of effect of trauma pretty much is when a child doesn't get the care nurture and honestly support that they need to regulate their nervous system. Unfortunately, that child is just pushed into different settings and those settings, even on a systemic level, are not equipped to help that child, which is very unfortunate, you know, and it often starts in the school system and that school system specifically in the Black and Hispanic community and more so in the Black community, this now leads to the school to prison pipeline where we see a lot of children who have higher levels of exposure rates have a higher likelihood of engaging in some sort of criminal activity and therefore ending up in the criminal justice system. And so they also don't have the resources to have lawyers pay their bailout fees, all of those things. And so it's just this ripple effect that leads to, again, more fragmented communities and um, people just dealing with the repercussions of not getting the help that they need from the onset of being traumatized. Yeah, that's a great explanation. And there's a, there's a, there's a true sadness mm -hmm. in what you're describing here. It, it, you know, the adverse childhood experiences questionnaire, you know, the ACEs of what they call, we did a show on that a little while back. And it, uh, it brings to our attention those things that happen in a child's life, the child being innocent, but these things that occur to a child that leave them with adverse effects, trauma in, in many cases, sets the trajectory for the child that innocently really has no say in these things. You know, they don't have a frontal lobe. They don't have the support systems around them. They don't have the abilities to work through these things. They're more in a reactive, how do I stay safe? How do I adapt? And what kind of meaning am I making in all of this state, which leaves them extremely vulnerable? And it's hard because the family is the place, ideally, where these things take place, you know, the, these healthy things take place. And when it doesn't work in the family, we expect all of these other institutions, including the educational institution, which by definition is about education, not mental health. Yeah. And so we're looking to dump on teachers and that one school, you know, social worker that we all have that is supposed to take care of a thousand kids and it's that's above, you know, the possibility. Now we're looking at other places to do what the family couldn't do. And I want to kind of raise something here and kind of shift a little bit, you know, kind of some ways to deal and heal and how to start addressing some of the loneliness, the fractures, the things you're talking about that can happen. And I want to read a couple of things. You say healing requires action and self-responsibility, the goal to empower, doing your own due diligence to experience joy. And you say, but we don't necessarily heal to exist in a vacuum. We heal to integrate into our communities and participate in healthy, nurturing relationships. And in doing so, we experience healing that comes with a sense of belonging, support, and care. That this, That's beautiful. Thank you. What you just said right there in, in, in your book, it's, it's, that's lovely. And I shared in an introduction that your focus in your work is around developing self-efficacy and building community. Uh, I know that you're a first generation, we talked about this on our first show, which is pretty cool. You're first generation Panamanian and Colombian. And you grew up in this multi-generational household that emphasized the importance of community, togetherness. And it 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 clearly is what you're encouraging folks to kind of replicate what was your community, your, your family that you grew up in and having them take control of their mental health, building meaningful relationships and propelling them forward. Riff off of that a little bit more for me, would you? Yeah, I think that um, 
community care, I, I am seeing less of it as we progress as a society. Yeah. And what I mean by that is simply that I do think that the wellness space and the healing space has expanded, which I think is a beautiful thing. But I think in the midst of this expansion, I am seeing a lot of conversations that lean toward individualistic healing. And although we need that, because I also yes. talk about how self-care is a bridge to community care, but community care is a bridge Absolutely. to community healing. Yes. And so I do believe that we have to heal on an individual level, but at some point, we also have to figure out how do we engage in collective healing, which is what community care is. Right. We have to learn how to be very mindful of our own traumas and our own needs while also being able to use discernment and recognize that the people we want to be in relationship with also have their own traumas, they have their own needs, they have their own desires. Yeah. And so it's like I always say to people, it's beautiful, beautiful for us to have these affirmations where we say, I deserve, I belong, I'm this and I'm that. But you also have to remember, so does your neighbor. They, yes. Your neighbor deserves too. They belong too. And I don't want people to get so I focused mm -hmm. that they forget the importance of being we focused, which is yes. like, I deserve certain things, but so does my partner. You so bet. does my friend. Even when I enter the work environment, this is a work relationship between me and my employer. So I am going to have needs and desires in the workplace, but the workplace is also going to have rules. Everywhere I go in society, it is not just going to be about me. Yeah. And I want people to be more mindful of that because I do think Social media has played a role in this fragmentation in a way because it's creating more so of those pseudo relationships. Mm -hmm. And it's also creating an outlet where people can vocalize their anger and their frustration about their family members and different things. And you get people who validate your experience without actually knowing the other side to the story. Exactly. Well, <laughs> the way a therapist would inquire and say, well, exactly. can you let me know a little more information <laughs> here? Because man, this person sounds like a really terrible person. And then I end up finding out so much more information that I'm like, okay, yeah. now wait a minute. I think we need to go back a little because I've been in those spaces with clients before where they will literally paint a person as the most terrible person. And when I learn more information by asking questions and being curious, I find other things out that I'm like, okay, I think we need to sit with this a little because there's some things I hear that you present with that are actually problematic in this situation too. You know, and I'm actually having a little more empathy for that person that you've been here complaining about, <laughs> you uh, know, and so that is what I mean when I say the, that added layer of social media, because I think social media has played a beautiful role in creating a, creating a space for us to be socially connected. But I do think it's easy to fall in that social disconnection trap as well, depending yeah. on your motive. And depending on how you use social media and what you're looking for, and it can be really easy to be the victim when you show okay. up in an online space and have people validate that you are the victim without knowing any other nuances, you know? And, and that so keeps I do, us more isolated. It does. And that doesn't even that doesn't even mean that we heal just because I get empathy for or pity for or sympathy for my situation. I'm not healing. Right. I'm just having someone else lick my wounds with me. Exactly. And so I'm not growing. I'm still disconnected, still isolated. And nothing changes. What, 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 what you're holding up, I think, is really a key piece. We are responsible for our own healing. If I get hit by a car going across the street, it's not that person's job who hit me to bring me back to my prior level of functioning, you know, physically. It's mine. And if I want to walk with a limp all my life, well, that's my choice. But ideally, I do whatever I need to do to rehab that injury. Same thing mental health-wise. If I go through a trauma, it's mine to heal. And that's what I think you're trying to empower people around. You're, you're, you're encouraging the practice of this efficacy. Belief in his or her power to execute behaviors necessary to achieve growth. Mm -hmm. And the confidence in the ability, you say, to exert control over one's motivation, behavior, and social environment to grow in those ways. And then what you're saying that I love is, but we're also responsible to each other as kind of fellow human beings here. Yeah. I'm responsible to you. You're responsible to me. Doesn't matter our color, doesn't matter what we live, doesn't matter our upbringings, doesn't matter any about that. If we're going to be a national family or a world family, I'm responsible for you somehow mm. in the best possible ways. Right. Responsible to you to show up in a way that can help you grow and you with me. 
And I love that other side of that coin. It's my personal growth. And on the other side of it is how can I help you grow and how are you helping me grow? Exactly. And I think that when we can adapt that ideology or that philosophy around life, we will see more healing in many different spaces. Absolutely. And that goes back to that collective healing piece where we can't have collective healing without the individual healing. So we need that, but we need to know how to bridge it to our community. So we need to learn how to bridge it to the interpersonal relationships we're striving to create instead of walking into our relationships again with this I deserve mentality, but you don't deserve. So right. when I have a need, I will advocate for myself, but I will belittle you when you have a need. And I think that's some of the things that I notice can be happening. What are you seeing as some inroads to us healing some of the fractures? And I so appreciate your perspectives on these. Our racial fracture, fractures, our socioeconomic fra you know, fractures that we have, let, let's just stay with the one that's most easy to kind of go around. It's more, more the racial fractures that we have, you know, you close your eyes, I close my eyes. We can't tell each other what the other person's color is. We don't know. It doesn't matter. But there's an importance of respecting that piece, understanding the background. How, how are you talking about ways to build and to heal some of the fractures and build a greater awareness and understanding so that there's a healing and a growth that can take place as part of our trajectory here in some of these splits that you're seeing. What are you recommending? I think the first thing I recommend is we really have to learn to manage our own biases. Yeah. Because I do think our biases get in the way of creating community. We have certain stereotypes or ideologies about groups of people. And we exist in a country that we are very much aware it's founded on having negative stereotypes and perceptions of Black people, followed by other groups of color. And I think the first thing is that we have to recognize that we're born into, into a society and an American society that has had a lineage of ideologies that can be hateful and can be demonizing to communities of color. And we always have to be cognizant of recognizing, am I conditioned to judge a Black man a certain way compared to a white man? Am I conditioned to judge a Black woman in a certain way, especially if she is in a position of power in the workplace, compared to a white woman who is in a position of power in the workplace? Yes. Am I conditioned to see Black children a certain way? Because parentification is a big thing that there's a lot of studies around how Black children, especially young Black girls, are parentified in different ways where young Black girls are seen as adult-like. And so studies show that teachers kind of feel that Black girls are loud and attitude-y and they, are, they tend to treat them as if they're grown women. And that same study shows that even police officers misconstrue the ages of several young Black boys, assuming that they were four to five years older than they were, but then they minimized the ages of young white boys where they said that they were four to five years younger than they were. So there's this innocence attached to young white children where there is this aggression attached yep. to young black children. And all of that just simply comes from social conditioning. We can't erase our country's history. It is embedded in literally the soil of the American system, right? We can't go back in time and erase what happened. We also understand that there are certain ideologies our families may have held that are intergenerational. Mm -hmm. And another thing is unconscious bias, where we absorb different forms of stimuli from the things that we see on the news, from the things that we see in the media. And so there are times where we don't realize we're subscribing to certain beliefs and ideologies, not because we as individuals were harmed by a particular race, but because society is telling you certain messages specifically about the Black community or other communities of color. And I think one of the things we have to remember as individuals, no matter what race you are, we are wired to self-protect. Mm -hmm. And so to, through self-protection and regulating our nervous system, even if you didn't have a negative encounter with a Black person or a Hispanic person, any person of color, if the news is telling you to, to run, stay away, clutch your purse, do these things, 
The moment you engage with someone who is a person of color, you might notice that your bias is manifesting your behavior and there's a discrepancy between the way you think and the way you be you act. Mm -hmm. And I find this comes up a lot in my allyship trainings because I will hear a lot of people say, I'm not racist. <laughs> I love people of color. I love black people. I have black friends. But there are certain things that they behaviors they engage in that might seem as if you have an opposite belief. There is a discrepancy in the way we think and the way that we act. And so sometimes we're harboring certain beliefs and ideologies, but we don't realize we are so deeply programmed mm -hmm. to behave a certain way that even if we think something, our behavior might come out differently because we're acting on a subconscious level. And so I do think that one of the things that we all can start doing is paying attention to our biases. We all have bias because... Mm -hmm. Even in communities of color, you have internalized oppression, which basically is a form of internalized racism where the more you are exposed to negative ideologies about your own community, you might start to believe them. So you as a Black person might be in the workplace and say, I don't think this other Black person should get promoted because I don't think they're smart enough. Why would you think that when they have all the qualifications, right? Why do you think that the white person deserves this thing more than the Black person? Is it your internalized racism, right? So when I'm talking about us challenging our internalized biases, I'm talking about literally every single human being on the planet, regardless of your skin color, because we have certain biases about our own races and we have certain biases about other races. I think the other part, too, is recognizing the huge intergenerational trauma piece. And I think one of the things that we have been struggling to accept is the ways intergenerational trauma manifests in the present, especially if the onset of the trauma is something that happened in our past. Mm -hmm. And so people don't realize because of epigenetics, the changes that have happened to African-Americans in their DNA and the fact that there was no trauma-informed care when slavery was abolished, it now led to intergenerational trauma that impacts Black communities up until now in 2024, despite the fact that slavery ended over 400 years ago, right? And this comes from a lack of knowledge around just intergenerational trauma and epigenetics. And I do think the more we learn about our history, the more we learn about trauma through an intergenerational lens, as well as through a historical lens, we will be able to understand the way trauma manifests in certain communities and how it leaves certain communities more fragmented than others. And I think the last thing I'll add is just compassion and empathy. I think sometimes you want to intellectualize everything and we'll mm -hmm. say, well, you know, I have a friend who X, Y, Z, or we try to bring in other scenarios when harm has been caused. And I just think it's really important to just be empathetic and compassionate to the needs of other people and to recognize what Nina needs to feel psychologically safe in a relationship might be different from a different Black woman, mm -hmm. you know? And you can't assume that what I need, all Black people need. Mm -hmm. Also, as you shared earlier, I am a child of immigrants. I even recognize as a Black woman in America, my struggle around race is completely different from my peers who are African-American versus my family and recognizing, knowing my family history, knowing that I can trace my ancestors back to England, knowing the, the different things that I know about my own cultural system from Panama and Colombia, it's completely different too. We're not a monolith. Yes. And so I think it's just also about having compassion for the individualistic needs of people. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That is so good, Mina. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the, um, this idea of these biases that we all carry, and, and even if we don't want to carry them, we, like you're saying, we can't help but be impacted by all the things that are out there, whether it's social media or our generational, you know, legacies are, we, we, we can't help but be biased in some ways. We, we, we all have them and we're not going to be ever biased free. It's just, Sometimes they get in and they're there, but you're encouraging that we maybe understand what our biases are. What are you encouraging people to do? Let's, let's just kind of keep this kind of just short and sweet here. How do I find out about my biases? And once I've got it, what would you want me to do with it? Yeah, that's a good question. So your biases really are the different ways you've been programmed to view a particular person or a situation. 
-hmm. And so one of the things that you want to do is pay attention to the way those biases manifest in certain relationships. And it can manifest through your belief systems about a person, the thoughts you're having about a person, but also your behaviors toward a person. So how do you react to certain strangers? That can show a particular bias that you have. Because even if you don't know the person and already you're like, oh my gosh, I see this person across the street and now I want to run, that's a bias, right? right? And so that helps you to understand that you have a certain belief system that's manifesting in the moment. And I think it's important to reflect on what is that belief system and then do the work of just simply challenging it. And we can challenge our biases by one, first identifying where did I get this information from? Why do I have this reaction to certain people or certain circumstances? And the next thing I do want to say is, what can I be doing differently? You know, how can I challenge that bias by considering a different option? So if it's natural for me to react a certain way, what is plan B? What is another thing that I can do? But I think the first step is just honoring and recognizing that this is a bias that I hold and then just figuring out how can you reframe the way you think about that situation. Yeah. I love the idea too of once you recognize it, try and maybe see if you could experience a corrective emotional experience mm -hmm. uh, and challenge that bias to see if it's really true and to probably recognize that it's not and to free yourself from something that keeps you. I think one of the things around the biases that's disappointing to me is that you miss out on understanding somebody else and growing from the shared knowing that comes from that piece. You talked earlier about, and I use this sometimes when I do some couples work or parent-child work, there's always two eyes and a we in every relationship. And you're talking about how we can be responsible for each other. We can be accountable for our, our our biases. And if someone else is doing that, we can have such an enriched we relationship where we understand each other. We grow in ways that we may not have understood that we could. We appreciate mm -hmm. life more, you know, more deeply. And um, I, I love the things that you're you're hinting towards here. Well, you and I could go on for a day. This is like the shortest hour in podcast history mm -hmm. right here for me. But I want to leave our listeners with a message uh, from you about the power of community, about the healing that can, can take place both personally and collectively, and ways that maybe our listeners might consider building more community into their lives. I think that the one thing that we can be thinking about is, one, how can we start making bids for connection? Because I do think in the midst of us feeling socially isolated, we forget that in order to create community, we do have to do the work of putting ourselves out there yeah. to meet people and to connect with people. And at the root of every relationship is trust, respect, reciprocity, and safety. Mm -hmm. So how can you bring that to the relationships you're trying to form, but also how can you ensure that you're seeking that? from the relationships that you form so that you can use discernment to recognize, well, is this a relationship that I think is healthy for me or is it a relationship that I may have to walk away from? Yeah. The other thing I want to encourage people is to also think about community as a lens of your third space. And so maybe people listening right now may realize, you know, my home did become my first, second, and third space because I'm not as social as I used to be. So how can you change up your environment? If you work from home, can you work from a coffee shop? Can you work from the public library? Are there different things that you can just do to ensure that you're spending more quality time outside of your home environment? And one of the ways that we can build stronger communities is when we frequent certain communities too. So if you are someone who's looking for deeper connections, showing up somewhere once every six months, you may not develop a deep connection. But if there is a club or some sort of meetup group that meets on a weekly basis, maybe attending once a month or twice a month, you'll start to familiarize yourself with the people that exist there so that you can develop healthier relationships. Yeah. So I think the core thing is remembering that self-efficacy is your belief in yourself that you can engage in change. Yeah. And change is necessary for our healing and so you have to have the belief that you can get the things that you want out of life, but you have to put yourself out there to get it. Outstanding. That's a great, that's a great takeaway message. Well, as we wind down the day, I'd love our listeners to learn more about you after today's show, as well as your book, Owning Your Struggles. Tell us about how people can follow up with you after our show today. 
People can follow me on social media. I go by Mina B on both LinkedIn as well as Instagram. You can also head to my website where you can sign up for my newsletter, Mindful with Mina. And I'm also the host of the podcast, Mindful with Mina, which you can be listened to on all podcast platforms. And of course, lastly, you can order my book, Owning Our Struggles, across all major book retailers. Fantastic. Well, you're a wonderful guest and I've always enjoyed it. I'm glad we had a second time today and we're going to have you back at some point. I just so appreciate your perspective on things, your mind, the way you communicate things. It's just so beautiful. And I, I love this idea of the personal responsibility through the efficacy, believing that we can do these things and bringing people alongside us to help us heal. We deserve to heal. Everybody deserves to heal those areas that more times than not, it's not necessarily their fault for going through some of the things that they went through, but we are responsible for our healing and there could be freedom in that. And then when you're talking about that freedom that comes, then we get to help each other grow and our communities become stronger. So I, I so appreciate your message and uh, thanks so much for being with us today in the show. Nice to have you back today. Thank you, Graham. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining Mina and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash bhd. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tried Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.